Lord, we thank you for the peace of Jesus Christ. Thank you that your presence that is here today, Lord, we're thankful for all that you do for us. Thankful that we can respond in worship, we can meet together, we can love one another. Lord, I pray you'd bless us today as we hear your word. I pray you'd help me and you'd help all of us receive. In the name of Christ, we rebuke every evil scheme, any distraction. Let the Holy Spirit be the spirit of truth here this morning. Amen. So um, I asked um, David what I should preach about. I said, David, are you home? I texted him. He said, no. He said, but we're going to talk about faith. I said, okay, I can do that. So um, today I'm going to talk about joy. Because I didn't have a sermon on faith. <laughs> and Johnny only told me a few days ago I was on. So I had to uh, you know, adapt. And uh, besides, basically, as you know, um, I like talking about uh, resentment. And I've talked about that a lot. And it's like the opposite. And, and I, even though I talk about things a lot, um, it takes seven times for anything to go in. That's what I tell my family. So, and I get to preach like three times a year. So you'll, you'll probably get the same ones until you, I do them seven times and then we're done. We'll move on, okay? Anyway, so joy and then, um, so I was a good boy. I went to Sunday school. I'm sure Jacob went to Sunday school. Who, who here went to Sunday school? Who was privileged enough to have a Christian family and go to Sunday school? Yeah, yep, there's one. So if you did, because I, I um, Krista didn't know this song, I don't think, right? No, she didn't. But anyway, Jacob's going to sing you a song that we all know. Phil's going to have to sing it. <laughs> You're going to have to sing it to hear, but I'm not singing it. Joy is the flag flowing high from the castle of my heart. From the castle of my heart. From the castle of my heart. Flag high from the castle. Residence there. Let it fly in the sky. Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know. Let it fly in the sky. Let the whole world know that the king is in residence there. If we're really good, we'd go for the round. Right? Oh. <laughs> but we're not doing that. We'd need David Hood for that. <laughs> He doesn't look like to be in a mind to attempt it. And maybe a drummer. So, okay. Joy is a flag. Did, so who knew that song? Everyone knew that song, right? Except for Krista. Um, did we know that song? Okay, yeah, yeah. So I used to sing that lots and never even thought about what it meant. We just used to sing it and wave the flags. And we're lucky that we went to the church where we had a flag. And... Um, Flags are very important. So I now understand why the Salvation Army had a flag. It's because it actually meant something. And flags mean something, and so should joy. So here's some flags. Um, flags are generally very recognisable, right? You'd know all of those flags that are up there. They convey brand or meaning or emotion or they communicate. They identify you. So we have um, the Red Cross, right? Very common flag, keeps people safe, as long as people follow war rules, it keeps you safe at war. There's some dodginess that goes on at wars sometimes, but that should keep you safe. You know, ambulances, of course, got the um, Union Jack, Boxing Kangaroo, Australia Day flavour there, uh, the chequered flag from racing, um, the Canadian flag, famous mate, and of course the, uh, the Jolly Roger that I'm sure struck terror into many a person on a boat when they saw that. So, flags, are recognisable, they identify you, they symbolise meaning, they communicate, and they have an emotional bonding. And I was talking to Lloyd about this last week, uh, two weeks ago, at his church, and just as I was talking, this memory flooded back to me, and you'd all probably have a similar memory of putting the flag up at primary school. I, I had not, never even thought about that, but you know, it, there'd be someone's job every morning to go and fly that Australian flag, or like some schools had, say, three, like an, uh, an Australian, an Aboriginal, and a Queensland flag. But now you often have the Torres Strait Islander and maybe the school flag. You know, some, some schools will fly one or three or five, depending on how good their flagpoles are. And uh, I'm going to have a chat to Michael and see how many flagpoles we can get out the front of our school. Because um, th there's more flags we can add, Michael, if we, you know, even if we start with those five. So. <laughs> And, and every kid wants to go, so this will be fine. So 
flags. And flags communicate. So this is uh, what they call semaphore. And so people can talk to each other over distances using flags. But even ships themselves, um, they fly flags from their masts, which actually means something as well, uh, different to the, to the semaphore where they're um, talking to each other. Amazing. And um, you know, I was talking about flags having emotional bonding, like they, uh, we know the Americans are big on that. You know, they, they really love their flag. But um, you know, you don't see it so much now, but um, armies march the flags, right? And that's why we have great games like Capture the Flag. Because you know if your flag went, you were done. That was, flag gone was end of battle. And, and some of these, um, I was reading stories in these Roman legions, where some of these legions had like nine guys killed or 15 guys who were flag bearers killed because they were big targets. Um, and the, you know, you gotta remember you're in a time where you didn't have, you know, all the modern SAS guys that all have headsets and you know, they're talking to each other and some guy back in America has got it all live streaming on a screen and telling people where to go, you know, off satellites. They didn't have that back in, they had a flag. So they, um, so they were actually a rallying point for a battalion and, and they brought focus and realignment and purpose and they marked locations and they actually used them as signals and um, they bu built pride and morale for the battalion and when they lost, in fact the Romans especially went to great lengths not to lose flags or they had um, standards as well like eagles or boars on, in that picture it's a boar but eagles especially on the end of poles. There's one um, battle they fought and they lost three in one battle and they actually fought ca campaigns and lost men just to get the flag, just to get the standards back. It, wa it wasn't over any particular territory or anything, it was, it was just to get those, the flags back. And so it's, it's amazing, but it's because they mean something. So then when we're in the Salvation Army and there's a flag there, it actually means something. And so if you're in an organisation that has a flag, maybe it's worth finding out the meaning of what that is. And, um, Anyway, invariably, a loss of flag was a loss of battle. You're done. Christians have a flag. This is the Christian standard. I love how they call, the, they call flags standards, you know? And, and so when you're talking about carrying a standard or raising a standard or holding a standard, um, you know, you can link it to that picture. So this is, called, this is the Christian standard. And it's a white field with a red Latin cross inside a blue canton. The red of the cross symbolises the blood of Christ that was shed on Calvary, saving all who believe in him. The royal colour blue represents the reign of Christ and, the, and baptism for all believers who have become joint heirs. And the white represents the purity of Christ and his desire to cleanse every sinner and also surrender. And so that when we sing a song in Sunday school, it actually had far more meaning than us kids ever realised. Joy is the flag flown high from the castle of my heart when the king is in residence there. And then the, the chorus goes, so let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know that the king is in residence there. So flags also symbolise the residence of kings. So this is um, Buckingham Palace, and this is the royal standard, the king's flag, um, the royal standard of the UK, and it flies above Buckingham Palace. But it doesn't actually fly there because it's Buckingham Palace. It's, it only flies there when the monarch is there. So when King Charles is there, that's when that flag flies. But if the king has his annual holiday and goes to Sandringham House, or Windsor Castle, the royal standard is flown there. And in that case, they fly the Union Jack at Buckingham Palace. So when you go and visit Buckingham Palace on your European tour, as we all would like to do one day, if you rock up and see a Union Jack flying at Buckingham Palace, you know the king isn't there. Okay, but if you turn up and see a royal standard, you know the king is in residence there. That's what that means, okay? And when the monarch, when King Charles goes to the Palace of Westminster, when he goes to Parliament, 
the royal standard flies from Victoria Tower because the king is in residence there. So, what flag you fly shows who is in residence, okay? So once again, this song is starting to have a bit more meaning. Let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know that the king is in residence there. And joy is the flag flown high. And I know that's a Sunday school song, but if you, if you read in, I'm sure it's in Psalms 20, it talks about, 20 verse 5, it talks, lift up, you know, rejoice and lift up your flags. I'm putting a link right there. Okay, joy is a flag flown high from the castle of your heart to show the king is in residence. Anyway, what is joy? So we're going to talk about joy, um, how to get it, and of course it'll be just a, you can go and all do your own research because it's a big subject. So joy, as we know it's a fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Um, if you look up the dictionary, the definition is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. That is not a definition of joy. That is a very poor definition. And uh, anyway, it's what's in there. Um, so I would rather, so biblical joy is more than a happy feeling. It's a lasting emotion that comes from the choice to trust that God will fulfill his promises. So joy is a lasting emotion where happiness and great pleasure are fleeting emotions, temporary emotions. So that's why that is not a good definition of joy, because joy is a lasting emotion. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Joy is the response and the reaction of the soul to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that means it's a lasting emotion because that is truth. You know Jesus, you know what he did for you, you know your future, you know your purpose, which means your daily response is joy. It has nothing to do with happiness. So joy is not the absence of sadness. Joy is not the presence of the spectacular. Joy is a, a way of looking at things. It's a perspective. And it's a response to deliverance. And if you read through the scriptures, when you have the, you know, the children of Israel are delivered, you have the song of Miriam or the song of um, Jethro, like something, a physical deliverance, and they respond. Joy is a response to deliverance, and you've been delivered. You know, when, when Jesus was born, well, before he was born, and the angels appeared to um, the shepherds, well, they were singing, but more so, actually, when, um, when they responded to the, the Magi, when they saw the star, there was exceeding joy. That's the scripture I was looking for. When the Magi, when the wise man saw that star, there was a joy because it was a response to deliverance. It was a response and the reaction of the soul to the knowledge of the Lord. And Jesus himself said, um, when the disciples came back and were overjoyed and full of joy because the demons were responding to them, he said, don't be full of joy just because of that, but have joy because your names are written in heaven. So the joy is the response to what God has done for you. So joy is recognisable. It identifies you. It symbolizes meaning, it communicates, and there's emotional bonding there, just like a flag. So here's the verse of the day, because my dad's going through Hebrews, so our verse of the day is from Hebrews. So you can all write down your verse of the day today. Hebrews 12.2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that scripture comes at the end of, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that entangles us and hinders us and let us run with perseverance for the joy set. That's what Jesus did. So Jesus didn't find joy in the event of crucifixion. That when this is for the joy, it was the joy set before him. Jesus found joy in the guaranteed outcome of the event. So it says in the scripture that Jesus had joy going to the cross, but it wasn't because of the cross. Like it, was, it was the guaranteed outcome of that event. And the cross was just as painful. Like Jesus went through pain. Like it wasn't a superhero where none of it hurt and it was just going through an event. There was a lot of pain, but pain with purpose is a lot different to pain without purpose. And I'm sure all those 
giving birth among us, ha have a, a picture of this, right? If there's a purpose that makes a difference. Can you imagine so if I'm just walking and not knowing and someone like Karis just leaps at me off, say I'm walking under my deck, deck and Karis just leaps off me and just jumps on me, right? She's 29 kilos, right? I would, like, I would crumple. Like, you wouldn't be expecting it, right? It would get you, especially if it was dark or something. But if you go to the gym and put 30 kilos on a bar and squat it, you'd probably warm up with that weight, right? So the weight's not any different. The, the difference is the purpose behind it, the meaning. It's you knowing about it. That's the difference. So if there's pain, like for Christ on the cross, the purpose made a difference. Because it was for the joy set out before him. And so, so Jesus wasn't surprised by the shame. It said he scorned at shame. He wasn't surprised by the shame. And he wasn't surprised by the suffering or the pain or the blood or the whips. He wasn't surprised by it. He was ready. He had the joy set before him. And that's our verse for today. So in our lives, when we have to take up our cross, you have the joy set before you. You are well aware of what Christ has done for you. Joy is a response to deliverance. And it's a command. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. So God's desire. John 15 says, I've told you this so my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Now, some people think God doesn't want us to be happy, right? He just wants us to be holy. Now, I think the great way about, the easiest way to think about this is just think about your own kids because, you know, we're parents. And we want our kids to be happy, but we probably won't sacrifice our kids' long-term good for short-term happiness. Right? As parents, you're probably well able to juggle short term happiness to long term good. And I, I think that's a good way to look at how God the Father looks at us. He, he, um, he doesn't want us, to, you know, in particular to be any emotion, but He wants us to have long term good and, and, um, and joy. Um, Jesus said this right after He said, Jonathan spoke about this. Abiding in me. Jesus said, abide in me, remain in my love. And then he said that, I have told you this so my joy may be in you. So God's desire is that we remain in him and that's how we're full of joy. Okay, that's where the joy comes from. So it's a response to deliverance and then you remain in him. Psalm 16, 11 says, you make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Joy comes from the presence of God. Knowing those eternal pleasures, you look forward, it's a response to that. Psalm 511 says, But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. There's protection in, like, in the presence of God. There's joy and protection. Joy comes from knowing and trusting God. The Lord. So, how to develop joy. Now, I called it develop joy because um, you hear people talk about discovering joy, but when you're talking about discovering, it's like it already exists, right? Like if you have to discover gold, it, it means it's somewhere and you have to find it. And that sort of lends to people saying, if I don't have joy and I've got to discover it, well, maybe I have to change my job or change my relationships or change my family. or So, We'll talk about developing joy, okay, rather than discovering it. And in James 1, it says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, what's good about this first line? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Like, because I'm an accountant by trade, we count things, right? And this, this verse here, Counted All Joy, is um, it's telling you, like accountants have profit and losses, right? Or income and expenditures. So if we, if we were going a profit and loss on our own life, on the profit side, on the revenue side, income side, we'd be saying, um, 
like good experiences, you know, you all, and then on the expenses side, like the bad side, and you try to come up in front, right? More, more revenue than expenses. Expenses might be, uh, got a teenage kid that's causing me some grief, uh, got no money, um, you know, trials, very, various trials. And what James is telling us to do is, how about you can joy when you have various trials? So he's saying, look at your life, if you're an accountant, look at your life, look at all those various trials, and put that on the revenue side, okay? If you're looking at your ledger, if you're looking at your income statement, it says, count the trials as joy. If you're, if you're doing a pros and cons of your life, put the trials on the good side, put them on the pros side, not the con side, move them over. That's what he says, count it all joy. When you fall into, it, it does. I mean, I had to find the new came because the other one says consider, but because I had to have count. And counts in the New King James Version, so it's legit. <laughs> and uh, so count it all joy. Yeah. And uh, so, and it does say various trials. And who here has various trials? Yeah. And, and we all have different various trials, right? So my various trials aren't the same as your various trials. I'm saying this, there's a point here. Because some people have single people trials. And some people have married people trials. And some people have poor people trials. And some people have rich people trials. And some people have poor health trials. And some people have good health trials. But they're various. And we all have them. And fair enough, some people who are poor say, just give me a go at some rich people trials. Just, I reckon I could handle that. Just give me a go. <laughs> just, and single people might say, give me, give me a go at some of those married trials. Oh, I reckon I could sort them. But then there's some married people probably saying, give me a go at those single people trials. <laughs> right? Anyway, the Bible says there are various trials. So don't look at someone else who has different trials from you and think they're better than you or worse than you or whatever. They're just various. They are what they are. And the scripture tells you that. Um, what you need to know, though, is the difference between a trial or a temptation. Okay? Because temptations come from the evil one and trials come in various ways, I'm guessing, but not just from the devil. There's trials that just seem to be occur from the life happening and I'm sure God puts us through some trials. Um, so you need to be very prayerful about this. This is another aside, sorry, beside your various trials. Just remember, God gives very specific advice whether it's temptation or trials, okay? If it's a temptation, what does God say? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So the correct response to a temptation is what? Resist. If there's a trial, what's the correct response? It's not resist. Accept. Okay? So you've got uh, uh, many scriptures, but even like in Peter says, in 1 Peter 1 it says, In all this you greatly rejoice. Rejoice, there's that word again. Though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. He's alluding to various trials as well, not just one. These have come so that the proven genu genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, results in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. So the result of a trial is to bring praise, glory and honour to Jesus Christ. So, so the correct response to a trial is to accept it. The correct response to a temptation is to resist it. The problem is, a lot of us, me including, are very good at accepting what we should resist and resisting what we should accept. Anyway, I can't tell you which one is which, but you need to be prayerful because there's trials and temptations and there's different responses to them. But trials produce joy. And, and when that um, goes to the end of its course, you will be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You have to find the correct response to trials and temptations. Another thing I think we need to consider when we're developing joy is this scripture, Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Today is the day God has made. Like the scripture says a lot about today. Today is the day of salvation. I know human beings are a lot for, you know, when I get through this, I will have that. Like I knew when I was a kid I couldn't wait to get a driver's license. And so for years you're just looking forward and then you're thinking about like a girlfriend. Or, you know, you're, you're always, and you think, oh, I wish my kids grew up. Wish they, you know, left home. You know, people, I wish I had grandkids. You know, people are always looking forward to the next thing. I can't wait for annual leave. I can't wait for long service leave. I can't wait for my sabbatical. I can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says today is the day of salvation. And this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in today. So yeah, we do have to plan. We do have to look forward. But don't throw your life away waiting for the next thing when today is the day you have to rejoice in. What God has given you today is, um, I mean, the world has come up with a great term for it now. They call it mindfulness. But the Bible had it first. Today is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, it was Jesus who said, consider the lilies, consider the birds. He was all about being mindful before anyone else was. Just read the scriptures. And anyway, there's something in being thankful and full of joy for today and, and the things you're going through today, the things that are happening in your life, resisting temptations, embracing trials because they will cause you to lack nothing. So, parable of the tenants. I was going to get Jacob to sing another song, but he didn't really know it. He'd heard it, and, and I can't hold a tune, so uh, I'm not going to sing it. I was going to get David Hood up, but have you heard the song? Um, I've got something that the world can't give, but the world, and the world can't take it away. Right? I've got something the world can't give, and the world can't take it away. I think Jesus refers to peace. There's allusions to joy, but it's you know salvation, the Holy Spirit. I've got something the world can't give, and the world can't take it away. But there's a warning in that. Because even though the world can't take it away, there's two people who can. And we're going to read about it in this parable, the parable of the tenants, right? So the parable of the tenants, if you don't know the story, um, so a parable is a story that Jesus told to give an illustration of what the kingdom of heaven was like. Okay, and the kingdom of heaven started with the ascension of Christ. He, so we are living in the kingdom of heaven right now. And yes, it will be the kingdom of heaven when heaven is well, but we are we're living in the kingdom of heaven. And so the illustration was a master that went away for a very long time and had three servants, right? And he gave the first one five servants, five talents, second one two, and the third one one talent. And what happened was when he returned after a very long time, when you're thinking talents, there's a heap of different things, but say so let's think joy today just for... Picking something out of the sky, right? So when, when the um, king came back from his journey and he saw the first guy at five talents of joy had produced 10, he had developed his joy through, say, trials of many kinds. So he's gone from five to 10 talents of joy. He said, well, he said this, I got the verse. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So even if we're not talking of joyous talents, even if we're talking about talents given to you or your resources, I mean, it can be taken a million different ways. It's an illustration. You can take it however way we make the illustration work. But however you take it, the fact that he did something with it, he entered into joy. It says it right there. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Okay? In fact, my mum and dad gave me, it's a, like a little, it's a little plaque when I graduated university that had this verse on it, so that's why I remember it. Faithful in little, so I will make you rule over many things. Okay? So the second guy come in, he had two talents of joy, and he came back with four talents of joy, and same thing, same response. But the last guy, he, uh, he hid his talent. He... He said that he, um, he was afraid of his master, so he hid the talent, and this was the response from the master. He said, for the, and he took the talent off him, and he said, for everyone who has, more will be given, 
and he will have an abundance. But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So you might have something that the world can't give and the world can't take away, but I can tell you, God can take it away. Well, he can. It's a parable. It's an illustration of the kingdom of God. The old uh, use it, like use it or lose it. Like um, for, for those who have, they have more. And those who don't have, what they even they have will be taken away. So we read, you know, we are taught at church about sowing and reaping and, you know, give and you'll be given and forgive, it'll be forgiven. This takes it to a whole new level. This, this has a direct conversation to those people doing nothing. Like not just the people doing something, but the people doing nothing. Even what you have will be taken away. So if you have something that the world can't give and the world can't take away, just, just be thoughtful over who may be able to take it away. But the second person who can take it away is you. The world might not be able to take it away, but you can take it away. And this is our verse of the day. So for Christ, it was for the joy set before him. But you think about that story, another parable of the prodigal son. And even though we all think the story is about the father and the prodigal son, just as much as it's about that guy at home. He was home, but not happy. Okay, the older son at home who, who had the grumpy attitude when the younger son came home, that was his status, home but not happy, home but not full of joy. How long have I slaved? Like he was a, he was a worker, no joy. Anyway, I can tell you, your job can't give you joy, your job can't take it away. Your girlfriend can't give you joy and she can't take it away. Your husband can't give you joy and he sure can't take it away. Situational interest has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. And what brings joy is not looking around, not looking to your job, not looking to your girlfriend or your husband or whatever circumstances are around you. Your life would be more enjoyable if you didn't look sideways. For the joy set before him. You can't be looking around and expect to have joy. I can't be judging my situation according to others. Nothing destroys joy like comparison. And you're praying for more joy, but destroying the joy God has given you. The world might not be able to take it away. Your husband might not be able to take it away, but you sure can. And you're destroying the joy of your salvation just by your perspective, where you're looking, social media, comparison, instead of the joy set before you. It's part of the process of why we come to church and we listen to sermons like me talking because it transforms the mind. Like Romans 12 says, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So come to church. Remember your bodies, it's a living sacrifice. Part of your whole life, coming to church is a living sacrifice. And you come here to have your mind transformed. So back to that joy flag. This is a picture of Buckingham Palace in September 2022. This is when the Queen died. So the Queen's not in residence, no royal standard. The Union Jack is flying, but at half mast. So that symbolises no one there. No one's in residence there. So... The challenge today is if joy is the flag flown on the castle of your heart, is it, what, is it a flag flying at half mask? Is it, like, like, you can only fly the joy flag if the king's in resident. That's what the song says, right? So if there's no joy flag, there might not be any king either. I don't know, like, you've got something the world can't give and the world can't take it away, but have you taken it away? 
like fl flying the flag. So let it fly. Um, John 12, 32, Christ says, I'm lifted up from the earth and I'll draw all men unto myself. So even Christ in his death, you know, it was like he, he was the, the standard, the signal, the, the communication. He said, as I'm lifted up on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. And that is what you are called to as well. So, you know, rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made. And um, embrace those trials, accept them, resist temptations, and choose joy. So joy is recognisable. It identifies you. It symbolises meaning. It communicates and it has emotional bonding. Just like those Roman flags that were lost and they chased them with the death of men to get them back. That's, that's joy for us too. It, it, there's an emotional connection there. Like it's a, but um, anyway, it, it's number one, it's definitely recognizable. People can see you and know it, okay? I'm gonna pray for you. And then we're gonna sing a song. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you chose the cross for the joy set before you you didn't look to the side. You didn't look at other people or make comparisons. You knew your purpose. Lord, you knew. Lord, we just thank you that even though you are well aware of the blood and the pain and the shame and the sin, you chose the cross. Lord, and we are so thankful for that. So let us as disciples, you know, committed to be followers of Christ, let us also... Um, have joy set before us. Let us be well aware of what Jesus Christ has done for us and live life accordingly. Let us um, be well, let us have an appropriate response to the deliver deliverance that is in our lives. And so Lord, help us to develop joy. When we have many trials, help us to choose patience and perseverance and faith so that um, that matures and we become complete, lacking nothing. Lord, I ask for the Holy Spirit to help us today with all of this. Lord, we have nothing without you. We can't modify our own behaviour. We need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come now. Look, Holy Spirit, I invite you into this room. May your presence fall on us as a people as we choose joy today. Amen.